All right, so uh, another sharing. This one uh, rife with human factors. So you know, we, we all know, we've all heard, you know, in, in accidents, this many, whatever it is, 80 plus percent is, uh, can be traced down to uh, human factor type elements. This particular one is rife with them. And I'm sure you'll be able to read in between the lines of, of some of the stuff that I've got here uh, for other things that I'm not specifically mentioning. Uh, in essence, it's uh, an incident where we had uh, a helicopter taking off with an engineer standing on the skid. Not typical configuration, obviously. Uh, so it was up in uh, Canada, in the Northwest Territories, way to heck and gone up there. Um, it was operating out of a, a mining camp, a Kelvin camp, uh, which, yeah, extremely remote. Uh, we had kind of involved in the incident, we had a pilot, uh, the operator, and a CGG training pilot that were on board. And uh, then obviously the engineer was around, and uh, we had a trainee operator at the, at the helipad as well, who was you know, watching what was going on, right? he was there to learn. Um, we were use this was using a squirrel to tow a bird, so external load, long line. Uh, probably, especially for Australians, goes without saying, severely cold weather. Um, if you look at the date, right, February in, in northern Canada. So very cold weather, uh, averaging around uh, 30 degrees Celsius below. On that particular day, it was reported as right exactly that in the middle, uh, 35 degrees Celsius, and a wind. I'll come back to that temperature thing uh, a little bit later on, too, and see why I specifically mention it there. So this is, this is uh, the scenario here. It was prior to the first flight of the day. Uh, the AME was conducting a walk around. Uh, walk arounds, if you have an, uh, an AME or a, a LAMI on site, they're not a foreign concept. Uh, in this particular case, the AME was specifically doing it because operating in those cold temperatures, you're quite prone uh, to oil leaks out of seals, right? So you take a, a seal on a bearing or a shaft or something and it's been sitting overnight, no matter how much you preheat the aircraft, that's going to be a lot colder than it's used to. So until it gets up to more normal operating temperatures, those seals aren't quite working the way they should and you, you can weep more oil than normal. Well, you shouldn't weep oil, but you, I think you see what I'm saying. Um, so he was, he was going out of his way to look for that um, because it was uh, a risk. Uh, and in this particular case, on this day, he did notice what he thought was uh, a bit of oil showing up on the deck, on the, on the engine deck, in the engine compartment. Uh, so uh, he uh, went to the pilot in command and told him that he was going to continue this walk around. He was going to go and sort of more than just look through panels. He was going to open up some cowlings and, and have a good look around. Um, and uh, so he briefed the pilot on it. At the same time, the pilot had some other concerns. There were other things going on uh, with this guy. And if I don't mention it later, I'll mention it quickly now. Uh, this was the, the first flight for this pilot on this job. They would had a, a crew changeover. Um, so he was getting used to the people around him. He was getting this, you know, this is the first flight. This equipment, how's this all going to go? He's got a lot on his mind. He did have the weather on his mind as well. There had been an incident out of the camp. Uh, in the very recent past, I think within the last week or so, where somebody took off uh, into cold weather, and I wish I could remember the specific details, but I don't think it ended that well for them. They, they took off in a snowmobile or, or something, and it might have result, uh, resulted in a search. So that there were a number of things on this pilot's mind, and he did express a concern about the temperature. You know, if something goes wrong at minus 35, uh, just how good is your survival gear and coming out to get me if the, you know, if the weather turns? So... Just another, another thing that's, that's on his mind. One of the other things that was on his mind and that he did discuss with the, with the engineer when the engineer came to talk to him about the walk around was the, uh, the display system that they had in the helicopter. It wasn't related to, to the airborne survey equipment, um, but it was, uh, it was sort of a fancy external torque gauge right, for, for external load where you're, you're not always looking at the, uh, ahead at the instrumentation and caution and warning lights and whatnot. There was a sort of a, a screen set up in there that would um, 
you know, give you information, sort of engine condition information and warning lights and, and, a, and a torque gauge that you could look at right there. But you could flick between screens to see different things, to prioritize uh, different things that you wanted to look at. And he couldn't quite see what was going on in the screen and he couldn't quite navigate his way through it. So it touches on a little bit of uh, what was being said earlier about familiarity with equipment and, and whatnot. So he had this conversation as, as part of that and, you know, perhaps that was more on his mind than what the engineer had just said to him. So the engineer, after that conversation, walked around the nose to go around to the other side of the, of the aircraft, had a look inside, was quite happy that there wasn't any oil and was closing everything up, uh, and was standing with one foot on the skid and one foot on the ground when the aircraft started to shift. So uh, he did a, the, the aircraft, it didn't lift, but it's, you know, you... you when you start to sort of pull power on the aircraft, the skid arrangement kind of adjusts a little bit, but it, it also did a little bit of a, a twist, a little bit of yaw. Um, so he moved the foot that was on the ground onto the skid. And I mentioned the yaw because the first, one of the first questions we asked was, why didn't you just get off the skid altogether? And his argument was, you know, these things twitch sometimes, so uh, rather than step off and then be in the path of this, this sliding or twitching uh, skid, you just step onto it and it's settled and you can carry on. But it wasn't just a, a momentary thing. The helicopter did start to lift um, and uh, with him on the skid, he jumped off about two feet up and walked around to signal to the pilots, to the pilots, because we had the training, our company training pilot, as well as the subcontractor uh, pilot on board to signal to them to land. So. They landed uh, with no problems, but I think you can easily imagine a helicopter lifting off, getting ready for a long line job, just you know, how high that engineer might have ended up with nothing to hold on to. So we did our investigation. The, the HPI, that's our, our hypo, right? high potential incident. We did an investigation and uh, did our root cause analysis. There's a bit of a, just a general sort of thing on it, um, but really, all the, the major, certainly the, the immediate causes and the, the more obvious contributing causes were all human factors related. Uh, and the a summary, if I can summarize the main things in that root cause analysis, was that the pilot suffered from mental saturation and distraction due to the high mental workload associated with a largely unfamiliar task. Uh, foreign operational equipment, that was the subcontractor company's screens and whatnot, uh, unexpressed safety concerns related to weather conditions. I mentioned that he did mention it, but it was after. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't communicated to the crew on the day or in any of the, the briefings or anything. Uh, and a foreign cockpit environment uh, with uh, our guys on board, uh, the clients, to them, the clients uh, training pilot on board. So changed the whole dynamic there. Uh, we did not have a formal structured briefing on the startup procedure. Uh, so we do have guidance and documentation behind that uh, to, to talk about, okay, what has to be briefed, how does the equipment work, what is the sequence in the cockpit during startup, what gets said, what gets asked, what's expected, uh, all that exists, but it didn't take place formally. It was part of other conversations, uh, you know, just in the mess hall, for example. So when you you all know when you do it that way, there's a really good chance that you're going to miss something. So there wasn't that formal uh, briefing. Uh, even with the, the documentation and the guidance we had, we didn't have uh, clear and concise uh, or a call for, for, for specific terminology in the cockpit. So, of course, we talk about communications and clarity in communications. It's in the survey, the SCRM, the Survey Crew Resource Management Training. Um, but there wasn't anything specifically uh, in that briefing document about what terminology should be used. Uh, in this case, uh, the pilot had asked, I, th I forget, I'm paraphrasing probably, but he had asked, you know, is, is everything good? And the operator said, yep, or yes, it's all good. But the operator was saying, yes, well, my equipment is good. Right? And the pilot was saying, is everything good? Can we go? So yes, didn't quite cut it. So it's not, it wasn't the final, oh yeah, that's when things went wrong, but it contributed uh, to that. And there was a failure to follow industry best practice with regards to giving all clear signals. Um, the industry best practice thing is a, is a tough one. 
because it's very easy to say. We, 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 we call something industry best practice because we see it commonly, but what we also know, and outside of this incident, is that industry best practice is not industry-wide. So you end up in places with other subcontractors where you, something's happening that the operator in the other region would just shake their head in exasperation. How the hell is this person doing this? You know, don't they know this? So uh, industry best practice isn't, isn't uh, as widely spread as we might like. So in this case, um, when it comes to giving the all clear signal here, I'm just talking about you know, the thumbs up when you have an engineer working around an aircraft and the engine's running, everything's going on. When they leave, what we're calling industry best practice is for the engineer to turn around and give a thumbs up, uh, eye contact with the pilot, give a thumbs up uh, before they carry on, so that you always know where the, the engineer is, or that there's, there's nothing else going around the aircraft. Um, for this particular company, it wasn't their standard way of doing things. They only did that in a sort of, generally in a, in a different uh, category of, of aircraft, the larger aircraft. Uh, because the larger aircraft uh, always had an engineer with it. Squirrels, A-stars, that size of aircraft, they didn't always send an engineer out. So the, it was just a, you know, not normal that if you put a, a pilot who flies squirrels with an engineer who works on squirrels, they didn't always follow that practice. Uh, some lessons. Obviously, that all clear communication from the AME to the PRC is is industry practice, but isn't always company policy. This should be a formalized requirement. We should be uh, incorporating that in our briefings, and, we, and in our briefings we should have specific terminology and signals that should be used. Uh, tied to that is this clearer guidance needed on, on what kind of terms are, are being used, used in the cockpit and how they can be misleading, misleading or misinterpreted. And of course, probably what's already uh, in some people's mind is uh, the you know, very clear realization that having somebody else in the cockpit changes that cockpit dynamic tremendously. You know, if you if you speak to the pilots, how do you feel about you know this this person here who's available to give guidance or, or to to help you out? Uh, the answer is always, oh yeah, no problem, no problem. But it's it's not no problem. It changes things uh, when we. We have a requirement, of course, for CRM, and uh, we work with subcontractors a lot, and we check that box, right? Has, has the pilot had CRM training? Uh, CRM training varies drastically around the world as well. I see there are some aviation authorities that are starting to, maybe not standardize it, but beyond, they're going beyond just saying, must do CRM training. They're actually coming up with a minimum syllabus, or minimum content of, of CRM. So if you go to a subcontractor and you, you check that box, yes, the pilot has CRM, uh, but when that pilot comes from a single pilot environment, uh, maybe doesn't get to use it very much, or maybe that CRM training consisted of an online module about decision making. Uh, so uh, there were some breakdowns or in, in crew resource management in the cockpit. Uh, and then the, uh, in the beginning I mentioned about having a trainee on site. Uh, Typically, you don't have somebody there, and certainly with that technology, you don't have these extra people kicking around. Uh, but a lesson learned was if you've got these people, why not task them with keeping an eye out for them, for, for things that might be going wrong? You know, if they're there at staging while the aircraft is leaving or arriving, leaving or arriving, why not task them with keeping an eye out and give them a means of communicating if they see a problem? In our case, the guy was there out of his own interest. Uh, and if he had seen something going wrong, or if he did recognize that something was going wrong, he couldn't do anything about it. He had no radio or anything like that. So those were some of the lessons we got out of that. 